Legal Briefing, send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. The government has imposed strict travel restrictions on six African nations over a new COVID-19 variant. Flights from South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, Botswana, Eswatini and Zimbabwe have been suspended from midday today and all six countries will be added to the red list. No cases of the variant have been found in the UK so far. In the last hour, the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has said that flights should be suspended with countries affected by this variant. And Health Secretary Sajid Javid gave a statement in the House of Commons this morning. He laid out the measures the government is taking to prevent the spread in the United Kingdom. Over the past 48 hours, a small number of cases of a new variant have been detected on our international genomic database. I want to reassure this House that there are no detected cases of this variant in the UK at this time. But this new variant is of huge international concern. Although I must stress that this is a fast-moving situation and there remains a high degree of uncertainty. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, even as we continue to learn more about this new variant, one of the lessons of this pandemic has been that we must move quickly and at the earliest possible moment. The UK remains in a strong position. We've made tremendous gains as a result of the decisions that we took over the summer and the initial success of our booster programme. But we're heading into winter and our booster programme is still ongoing, so we must act with caution. So we're taking the following steps. Yesterday, I announced that from midday today, we're placing six countries in Southern Africa on the travel red list. These countries are South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Eswatini, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. But this variant is a reminder for all of us that this pandemic is far from over. We must continue to act with caution and do all we can to keep this virus at bay, including, once you are eligible, getting your booster shot. So let's focus on what we know about this variant so far. Joining us now is Dr. Barrett Pankania, Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. You're very welcome uh, to the show, Doctor. Uh, and I suppose what I want to ask you is really, why is this variant of such concern? It seems to have caught us a little bit unaware. And do we understand how it has mutated? Yes. Um, so we have got several hairs running all over the world as a result of this variant. And what we have here and why people are uh, getting excitable about it is it has many mistakes in its reproduction. So if we imagine the RNA, that is the sequence of um, base pairs, bases that code for the virus. It's, in other words, it's code. And as a result of reproducing uh, in probably one person who was immune suppressed, it has made mistake upon mistake upon mistake. So now we have a variant with lots of mistakes. Second thing, the mistakes are also in the spike protein. In other words, several mistakes in the protein that codes for the thing that we make immunity and, and uh, ingress into the human cells with. Therefore, of course, people are excited, meaning it may be more infectious. On the other hand, it may also be less infectious. Only time will tell. It may be vaccine bypassing. On the other hand, it may not be. Time will tell. And I suppose that's the issue, uh, Doctor. I mean, you've said that it may bypass the, the um, vaccine, but how long is it going to take us to find that out? Uh, I was reading this morning that uh, in South Africa, they're talking about weeks uh, to find out if that is the case. And, and if it does take weeks, what should we be doing in the meantime? Well, we, we exercise precautionary measures and the precautionary measures of uh, being extra scrupulous with people coming from that part of the world is fair. But we also need to be looking for uh, cases that may be coming from elsewhere who may have had a origin in Africa to begin with. And therefore, in the United Kingdom, we are extremely well placed 
to do further additional genomic sequencing on our cases. So instead of doing, for example, 10% of all cases are genome sequenced, we up it to 15% or we target our genomic sequencing to um, cases that may have had any African origin or any travel related origin. That way our, measure, our actions are measured and uh, more focused into uh, looking for this variant. And then if we find it, we do the quarantine and exclusion from circulation bits, et cetera. So I suppose the question is, can we keep it out uh, of the UK? I mean, we've heard that um, this um, variant, this multiple uh, mistake variant is now in Israel. Um, we've heard it's now in Europe, it's in Belgium. How do we manage all of that? Obviously, we've added a number of uh, countries in Africa to the red list. I mean, should we be taking that further? Well, it is difficult. It is difficult to keep such things out. But what we can do is slow it down and do early detection. So the early detection is the genomic sequencing. The keeping it out is that measures for anyone who has returned to the UK and becomes a case, because they may introduce it into the country from a route that we had not thought of in the first instance. So those are simple precautionary measures to take. Having said all this, we mustn't let lots of hairs running. Whilst we are very interested in this variant, the variant may be innocuous. We just don't know. Yes, and I suppose that's the case. So we try and slow down uh, the variants yes. coming into uh, the UK. And during that time, we will learn more about the variant. Are you hoping that by the time uh, it does come that we'll know much more about it, Doctor? Indeed, and that is the strategy. Slowly does it so that we pick up our armamentums by learning from other uh, experiences in other parts of the country. But really, the key point here, which we are all missing, is why did it arise in Africa? And it arose in Africa because their population is seriously under immunized. And it is a big wake up call for the rich nations of United States, United Kingdom, European Union to enable Africa to immunize its people and reduce the chances of such variants arising. Even if it is targeted immunization of a specific population. And that specific population is people who are immune suppressed because it is they who make such variants. Well, Dr. Pankania, I think that has been very clear for us all. And of course, this is a global problem. It's always been a global problem, yes. despite the fact that we've been looking at it, obviously, from a UK point of view in terms of our vaccine. Um, but of course, it's a global problem and we need to, to work at it together. So thank you so much for joining us yeah. uh, this afternoon. After the break, we'll be looking at modern slavery and whether implementing green technology could be making the problem worse. Before that, let's take a look at the weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello, Storm Arwen has arrived and it's prompted a rare Met Office red weather warning. The strongest winds likely across the eastern coastal strip of Scotland and northeast England. The storm itself is heading south through the North Sea, but it's as these isobars really pinch together through the late afternoon and into this evening that we're going to see those strong, damaging winds. But everywhere across the UK, we'll see those winds picking up and there are multiple warnings in place. That red warning, though, first of all, particularly severe across the eastern coastal strip, strip of Scotland and northeast England. Gust of 90 miles an hour likely to cause damage, very dangerous waves. Two amber warnings in place as well, a widespread yellow warning and there are also a few snow warnings down the spine of the country. That's an extra hazard. See the Met Office website for details of all of those warnings. Let's run through the weather then because uh, we will see wet weather across the northeast as well as those potentially damaging gusts of wind sinking southwards and this mixture of rain, sleet and snow, snow mostly over the hills but pushing south across England during the early hours, turning a bit drier across the west and it's going to be a cold night, particularly if you're out 
out in that wind, which will strengthen further. Uh, the warnings remain in place into tomorrow, and there's the likelihood of further wintry showers coming in across eastern parts of England, turning more to rain as the day goes on. But still bitterly cold, the winds only slowly easing, still the potential for some disruption during Saturday. And uh, look at the temperatures, three to five degrees, add on that wind, well, it will feel sub-zero in places. It's going to get sub-zero pretty quickly on Saturday evening under largely clear skies as the winds continue to ease. Still some wintry showers across parts of eastern England. Could be a covering of snow in places. They steadily fade during Sunday, but it will be a very cold start. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone. Oh. Oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're well, over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Welcome back to The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster. The Prime Minister is facing criticism from France after sending an open letter with a five-point base plan to tackle the ongoing migrant crisis in the Channel. The French government described the missive as unacceptable and they've uninvited Home Secretary Priti Patel to a crunch meeting on Sunday as a result. French President Emmanuel Macron 
branded Boris Johnson's decision to publish the letter on social media as, quote, not serious. This comes after at least 27 people lost their lives while trying to cross the channel earlier in the week. We're joined in the studio by GB News Home Affairs and Security Editor Mark White. And Mark, you and I have been talking about this now every, every Friday. Friday. <laughs> every Friday we've been talking about this. Uh, bring us up to date on where we are at the minute. Well, it is an extraordinary set of uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in that come Sunday uh, when you're going to have a crisis meeting mm. taking place in Calais involving the French government, governments of uh, Belgium and uh, the Netherlands, Germany and the European Union also represented and not the British uh, because Incredible. the French have decided that what Boris Johnson has done in publishing this five-point plan is holding negotiations in the public sphere when this should be done diplomatically, etc. But to be honest, they're all pointing finger, fingers right from the start mm. when everybody was naively suggesting that uh, this could be a turning point, that everybody will want to get together now to try and solve this problem. Uh, I think right from the get-go, you had fingers already being pointed. Uh, the British saying that the French weren't doing enough. The French saying that uh, there is too much of a, a draw for these uh, migrants that want to come to the UK and the government needs to address that. Aid charities saying that it's all to do with the asylum policy run by a, yeah. an uncaring government in this country. And then, of course, the inter-party uh, squabbling that's all taking place as well between Labour and the Conservatives. I mean, everybody is just in entrenched but positions pointing the finger. It's quite an incredible state of affairs, though. I mean, 27 people at least died uh, in the Channel this week. And yet, all because a letter doesn't please the French in terms of its tone uh, and publishing it, open government, you might argue. Yeah. Um, he's, he's uninvited our Home Secretary. I think that's a bizarre turn of events. Can you imagine if the shoe was on the other foot? Yeah, listen, there's no doubt that politics is at play here mm -hmm. because actually what is being suggested in these... Uh, five-point mm. plan that uh, we've been privy to anyway. It seems reasonably mm. sensible. I don't think there's any way that the, the French government wants to stomach uh, British uh, border force personnel or whoever they want to send from the UK side on their beaches. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the whole sovereignty issue is one thing that they, they cite, but it's really help pride, isn't it? Yeah. They don't want the British to have to come and help them out. But then, in turn, they need to provide more of their own personnel on the beaches in the first place because they have a duty of care to those on their side of the channel to stop them being uh, sent out onto the water in these flimsy vessels in horrendous conditions. Uh, and if they're not going to accept the UK... Uh, sending extra personnel there, they've got to bolster the numbers themselves. And the other issue, of course, this returns policy, which you can take a step back and think, well, why on earth would the, the French want all these people back on their shore again? But yes, I think there would be certain, certainly some short-term pain, mm. but actually in the long term, they would gain from this because if you stop the people coming across to the UK in the first place, then there's no draw, is there? Because what is the point of going to northwest France? If you embark on this journey, you get to the other side and all they do is return you to France. So that draw goes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the thousands that are massing in towns like Calais and Dunkirk and Boulogne aren't going to have a reason for coming, knowing they're going to be sent back. But again, the French don't want any part of that. And, I mean, do you see this invitation being issued again before Sunday? Because, I mean, it seems bizarre to me that you would have an intra-EU discussion and not actually have the discussion with the country to whom these people are going to. I mean, and, you, would... and, you know, from all of the discussion we've heard uh, about it, not taking it seriously because they were tweeting, I mean, we've seen numerous tweets from the French, of course, of course about saying yeah. that, you know, people are going to the UK yeah. because the UK aren't dealing with this issue. They're yeah. allowing illegal immigrants to work in the UK. So, really... There needs to be a coming together of all of the countries, surely. There does, but relations, uh, sad to say, between the UK yeah. and France at the moment have been deteriorating for some time. Uh, and it seems that they're going in one direction, and that is sad, given that we have a very significant issue here that needs yeah. to be addressed. And it is just, uh, 
you know, unimaginable that you could actually have this crisis meeting and not include the very country that is the the lure for all these people that want to come across this side of the channel and clearly has something to offer in the way of any sort of talks or solution uh, to, to this potential problem. But it comes amid concerns over the Northern, Northern Ireland Protocol. It comes, of course, at the time of a row over fishing licences. And again, mm -hmm. we're seeing it uh, on that side of the channel with the uh, blockade of the port of Calais, uh, uh, plans or attempts to try and blockade uh, the Eurotunnel as well. So, you know, there are tensions. It's not good, but you would hope that there are calmer heads that are talking uh, behind the scenes with a view to getting this back on track and getting yeah. the British government represented at, this, at these talks. I, th I think that's critical. And I mean, just briefly, um, Mark, you've mentioned a number of flashpoints with the French, if you like. But of course, the UK is helping on the Belarus-Poland border. So you would hope that there are some in the European Union that recognise that that is the case. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think the UK sees what is happening on the... Poland, Belarus, Poland, uh, the uh, Belarus-Lithuanian border, mm. the Latvian border, uh, as being uh, an issue which, of course, is important to those countries, those allies mm -hmm. of ours, but also is a potential problem that is going to affect us further down the line because there is no doubt that a proportion of those, uh, if they make it across the border, will eventually head to those beaches in northwest France an attempt to cross as well. So, yeah, the, the British government is trying to help there. Poland has gratefully received that help. France, as yet, uh, doesn't want to receive the practical help in terms of boots on the ground, yeah. but seems happy enough to take £54 million pounds of our money. That's the case. Thank you, Mark, for coming in and, and bringing us uh, up to date on the migrant crisis. But still to come, uh, we'll be crossing live to Belfast to wrap up a week of special coverage from Northern Ireland. That's after the break. See you in a moment. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone. Oh. Oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News.
I'm Rhiannon Jones. Here are the latest headlines. Belgium has confirmed the first case of the new COVID-19 variant in Europe. The health secretary, Sajid Javid, says the situation is of huge international concern. The UK is imposing strict travel restrictions on six African nations following the discovery. No cases of the variant have so far been found in Britain. Police say 12-year-old Ava White, who died following an assault in Liverpool, suffered catastrophic injuries. Four boys, aged between 13 and 15, have been arrested on suspicion of murder. France has pulled out of talks with the UK, describing Boris Johnson's letter about the migrant crisis as unacceptable. The Prime Minister outlined a series of measures to deal with the channel crossings after 27 people drowned on Wednesday. French fishermen have blocked several ports in the ongoing dispute over post-Brexit licences. Fishing crews prevented UK ferries from docking or leaving the port of Saint-Malo this morning before targeting Calais and Ouistreham. They've also threatened to cause disruption at the Channel Tunnel. Extinction Rebellion activists are blocking roads outside multiple Amazon warehouses around the UK in Black Friday protests. The climate group says it wants to draw attention to exploitative and environmentally destructive business practices. Amazon says it takes its responsibilities very seriously. And forecasters have warned of travel chaos as Storm Arwen batters parts of the UK with 75 mile per hour winds. The Met Office has issued a red wind warning for parts of North East England and Scotland from this afternoon. We'll have a full update for you at the top of the hour. See you then. Thank you and welcome back. Modern slavery is a crime rampant across the globe, but it's difficult to spot and therefore it's often unreported. In 2019, over 10,000 potential victims were referred to police forces across Britain, but this figure having expected to have been risen in 2020. The Centre for Social Justice published a report last year called It Happens Here, equipping the United Kingdom to fight modern slavery. And it estimates that there could be up to 100,000 victims of modern slavery currently in the United Kingdom. Here at GB News, we want to explore how big a problem modern slavery is in the United Kingdom and indeed across the globe. And to do this, we're now joined by Matt Friedman. He's the CEO of the Mekong Club and author of Where Were You? A Profile of Modern Slavery. Good afternoon, Matt. And perhaps you could tell our viewers what you mean by modern slavery. Modern slavery is basically a situation where a person is tricked and deceived into a situation where they lose control of their life. They basically are stuck in a job, they don't get paid, and as a result of that situation, um, they call it slavery. Why? Because they can't leave. So actually there's est an estimated 40 million people in modern slavery around the world. There are more slaves today than any other time in history. And as a result of this situation, uh, we have kind of a, a global crisis that is out there that a lot of people just don't know about. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons why I think it's important that we do have this discussion uh, this afternoon. And you've set out the global position. But one of the things that I was quite interested in when I looked at the issue of electric cars and their need to have electric batteries was the fact that cobalt to make those batteries comes from uh, places where children uh, and other adults, indeed as well, are made to work in mines uh, in appalling conditions. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, about 50% of the cobalt comes from the Congo. The Congo is a country that's very poor. There's a lot of crisis there. There's a lot of issues that they've faced. Uh, as a result of that, people are in desperate situations. And so they get drawn to the mines because the mines generate a tremendous amount of profit. And so uh, the uh, estimate uh, of the number of people that have been in uh, difficult circumstances there from that report that you mentioned is something like 40,000 children. And uh, some of the children are as young as seven years old. So here you have children in a situation where uh, they are working in very dangerous situations. Sometimes they have to crawl into hole, holes, the holes collapse. Sometimes you have a situation where uh, the child uh, isn't wearing a mask and there are certain uh, 
kind of dust associated with it. So here you have a product that is consumed by the West in huge amounts for cell phones and cars that uh, is uh, basically contributing to modern slavery for a lot of people in that particular country. So I think that that is something that people should be aware of. And of course, the question is, what can we do about that? Because we want more people to use electric cars and therefore electric batteries. But we have to deal with this supply chain problem. And I think, Matt, that's something that your organization is very keen that we focus on, the supply chain. Isn't that right? That's correct. So basically, um, a supply chain is the Oh dear, we've lost Matt there. I'm really sorry about that because that was a really important story that we wanted to bring you today. So really, electric cars, really good thing, dealing with carbon emissions, uh, dealing with air quality and having better air quality. But because of the fact that we have these mines in places like the DRC, uh, with children who are being exposed to hazardous uh, conditions, uh, not wearing masks, having been exposed to possible lung cancers, we just wanted to bring uh, this story to you today, and we thought that that was important. I think Matt uh, is back with us again. Uh, and yes. really, Matt, we were wondering, what could we do uh, to try and help these young people who are working in this awful condition? Well, you know, uh, about 15 years ago, the chocolate industry faced something quite similar, where you had cocoa beans that were being picked by children, there was forced labor associated with it. And what the private sector did was to kind of fly down to Africa and do what they could in order to ensure that uh, the children are out and people were being paid and so forth. Something similar needs to happen. The phone companies are, or that are making phones, the car companies, need to understand that for this to go away, they have to play an active role in working with the government of Congo in order to help them to understand that unless this changes, they will eventually lose their market. You know, 50% of the uh, cobalt comes from Congo, but if they can't change the way this is happening, consumers are going to put a tremendous amount of pressure uh, on the businesses to say, it's great that it's green, but at the same time, if you're creating another problem in the S, the social side of ESG, then for the most part, you're trading one problem for another. And so people have to become aware of this and people have to put pressure on organizations that take cobalt to make sure that they know where the cobalt is coming from and that they are doing sensible, practical things to protect people so they don't find themselves in modern slavery. So, Matt, thank you for joining us and thank you for persevering uh, with your signal. I, I thought it was very important that we did come back to you. But it is important, of course, that we uh, don't have a green future and we all want to see that future coming uh, built on the back of uh, exploited children uh, in other parts of the globe. So it's very important that we discuss these issues. Thanks for joining uh, us, Matt, this afternoon. So a government review to safeguard the future of football says that Premier League clubs should pay a stamp duty style tax on every transfer fee to help support the English football pyramid. This is one of 47 recommendations made by a highly anticipated report led by the Conservative MP Tracy Crouch. This review was commissioned earlier in the year and it comes as controversies have engulfed the Premier League over last year, including the European Super League proposal and the Saudi takeover of Newcastle. United. Joining me now to discuss this is Tom Gretex. He's the Vice Chairman of the Football Supporters Association. Good afternoon, Tom, and thank you uh, for afternoon. joining me this afternoon. I'm sure you welcome the publication uh, of this report that comes along this week. Perhaps you could let us know why it's so important. I think, yes, we do. Um, the supporters organisations gave evidence to Tracy Crouch's review over the period of the last few months. And I'm very pleased, actually, that the review has identified not just the issues, but also some measures to be taken, because for far too long in football, we've seen uh, crisis after crisis with clubs going out of business like Bury and Macclesfield, the European Super League you referred to, and also lots of clubs that have been at various points on the brink. And that just isn't a situation we want to see continue. And it's because of regulatory failure. It's because of poor ownership overshadowing the very good ownership that there is at a number of clubs. And it's time that it's addressed. And I think uh, what Tracy Crouch has identified as a solution to something and what the government has said yesterday in, in response to that review, uh, I think set us uh, in a good position to be able to improve the situation in football for the future. 
Yeah, and of course, football supporters are often called the 12th man, if you like, um, because they're so important to the team uh, and to them doing well. Um, so it seems to me quite a, a natural thing that fans should have a say in the regulation and governance uh, of their teams. Is that something that you hope to see as a result of this review? Yeah, one of the proposals that's in the review is um, effectively for there to be what's called a golden share for significant issues that affect to do with the location, the character, the history and the heritage of the club. And I think that's really important that supporters through supporters organisations do have that say in those types of issues. It's not about the day to day running of the club so much as uh, big, big decisions that might be made by owners who are temporary. Um, that could affect you know, the links between the club and its supporter base and the supporter base in the communities. Because in many cases, football clubs are at the very heart of the communities where they're located uh, and they have a, you know, a strong bond with those communities. And we want to see that as something which is protected because that's an integral part of the character of English football. Uh, and whilst we don't want government running football, we do think it's important that we have a better situation than we have currently and an independent regulator to oversee uh, that, I think, is something which is long overdue. Yeah, and I suppose um, this golden share idea is there to protect uh, the club's heritage. As you say, uh, owners may come and go, but the football supporters, if they're true supporters, will uh, stick by their team uh, in thick and thin, and they'll want to try and sustain the heritage uh, of the club. Um, some people may be concerned about government becoming involved in football. You don't share that concern. Am I right? I don't, because this isn't about government getting or running football and sometimes it's been sort of characterized as that it's not uh, it's about a licensing system for clubs which basically means that clubs have responsibilities uh, they have to fulfill that's very similar to what happens in a number of other uh, nations france holland various other uefa nations and it's done by the governing body um in what's being proposed in tracy crouch's review is for for english football that would be an independent regulator so it'll be established by the government but it won't be the government running it and the government shouldn't be running the sport at all. But what the government should be doing, I think, is ensuring there's a framework there to protect the heritage and the character and the integrity of football in the interests of supporters and the wider communities. And that's what I think these uh, recommendations taken as a package and implemented will be able to do uh, without it being something which is effectively saying that government's running football, because government shouldn't be running football. And if these things were implemented, government wouldn't be running football. Well, Tom, thank you. And I, I noticed that the Premier League have said that there is a need to restore and retain uh, the trust of fans. So hopefully something can be developed uh, that is good for football uh, and good for the fans. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. So this week, GB News has produced a series of special show lives from Northern Ireland, focusing on the way in which the protocol is having an impact uh, in the province. And Liam Halligan and Darren McCaffrey have been uh, broadcasting from Belfast in a skillen where I was able to join Darren uh, and Coleraine. And Paul Hawkins has presented a documentary called Northern Ireland, The Problem with the Protocol. Now that was played out on Liam's show earlier and you can also catch it on our YouTube channel. But after looking at Northern Ireland's economic and political landscape, we're now joined by GP News reporter Dougie Beatty to get his thoughts on the week that he's had, uh, welcoming uh, colleagues from GB News over to Northern Ireland. Uh, Dougie, what have we learnt this week? Well, what a week it was for GB News. They brought a national, two national television shows to a region to have a look at what was going on there. They covered more ground in three days than I could cover in three weeks. We spoke to politicians, businessmen, uh, local journalists to find out exactly what was going on inside Northern Ireland. We broke down from the macro to the minuscule and what we found out was quite fascinating. We looked at, at the, the protocol in some detail. We know that a lot of manufacturers, as it stays at the minute, uh, as, long as, as long as the supply chains stay there, quite like the protocol because they have a foot in each camp. Uh, retail and pharmaceuticals don't like it at all. And, you know, we also found out that a lot of politicians in Northern Ireland 
just don't like to accept that there is a problem with the protocol. We spoke to the Road Hauliers Association in Northern Ireland is that small that we actually can't really sustain a rail network here. So everything is moved around by heavy goods vehicles and they are having serious problems and they're finding it very hard to speak to some parties in Stormout who don't want to accept that there's a problem. They say they're causing problems by themselves and that will come out in our shopping baskets later on as there's a divergence in uh, legislation. We spoke to manufacturers who think that there's a real problem between the Northern Ireland executive and themselves in their own education. They think that education should be aimed more towards what the private sector is doing. And we also spoke to the hospitality sector who are absolutely distraught with what's happening here over COVID passports and this extra line of, of legislation, administration that they're being asked to implement and they nobody seems I mean even today I'm standing here in a hotel in Belfast and nobody as yet has the regulations of the law that these uh, hospitality sector is due to uh, impose. It comes in here on Monday and nobody seems to have a clue what's happening. So there is lots of that going on in Northern Ireland but we also looked at how much innovation was in Northern Ireland, how many companies were moving on despite this and the companies left us all with one message. Give us the tools to do it and we will do it for you. But don't get in our way. Manufacturing will lift most places and most uh, economies out of recession. They know they can do that. One in particular uh, was actually down beside where you live, Arlington, in Enniskillen. And it was uh, an electronics firm that were doing marvellous things with defibrillators and everything electronic, to be honest. I didn't even know they were there. They were a marvellous company, but they cannot get staff that are being trained in the universities in Northern Ireland to uh, come and work there. So, look, thanks so much, Dougie. I'm giving you the weekend off. You can have a rest now. I know you've been working uh, very hard over this past period of time. Uh, and we've all enjoyed uh, the discussion, the debate, the breadth of analysis that we've had from Northern Ireland this weekend. It's not the first time I've heard companies say, give us the tools, we'll do the innovation, get out of our way. So our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, has spoken to Northern Ireland's secretary, Brandon Lewis. In this exclusive interview with GB News, they've discussed the latest round of negotiations, and there's more today, with the EU, and how the protocol is affecting Northern Ireland. And is the government any closer to triggering Article 16? Um, secretary, I think, first of all, you know, there's much speculation about uh, when the British government, or if the British government might trigger Article 16. You say the conditions are there. Why do you say that? Well, as we said back in July, absolutely yes. We think the conditions to trigger Article 16 have been met, whether you look at the disruption to society here in Northern Ireland, the uh, disruption to everyday lives of communities, diversion of trade, there's a range of issues. We are confident the conditions are met. We haven't triggered Article 16 because we don't want to. What we want to do is find an agreement with the EU. That's why we published the command paper. EU have published their proposals, and those are the negotiations that Lord Frost is leading right now. And so as much as I understand it, it's not that you want to get rid of the protocol altogether. You just want to change how it's implemented. Is that right? Effectively, yes. Look, the, the, the core principles of the protocol, we've said, Lord Frost, the Prime Minister, myself, we've all said there needs to be an agreement between us and the EU because we recognise that products moving into the EU from the UK need to be properly dealt with. What we're saying is the protocol was never intended to stop products from Great Britain moving to Northern Ireland that are being consumed and used in Northern Ireland going through the same processes as if they were going into the single market. And that's what we need to rectify. But what I can understand is because lots of unionists don't like the protocol itself. How, how are you going to satisfy that section of unionism that doesn't like the protocol if the British position is that actually the protocol should remain, it just needs to be changed in how it's implemented? Well, i say two things. It's not just unionism. Actually, it's the whole of Northern Ireland who suffer at the moment because of the way the protocol is working. And I had a meeting myself with Lord Frost and the first and Deputy First Minister, Sinn Féin and DUP, um, on Wednesday this week, where Michelle O'Neill herself was also saying, we need to resolve the issues of the protocol and we need to do it soon. So this is something that affects the whole community of Northern Ireland. That's why we as the UK government want to rectify this. In terms of why any particular person has an issue with it, whether it's the unionists have an issue or somebody who has, comes from the nationalist point of view, we want to make sure we fix the issues. It's the reason why they don't like the protocol that we want to resolve. If we can resolve those issues, and actually get a solution that works in Northern Ireland, so those products move as they've always done, without any risk to the single market. And let's be frank, as we've seen over the last year, the single market hasn't been at risk, but the UK internal market and the market for people in Northern Ireland has been damaged. And it's right, as part of the UK, that we rectify that. In saying that, largely, and we've been talking to businesses all week, 
uh, they actually are in favour of the protocol. They, they quite like it. Public support seems to be behind the protocol. I mean, lots of people do think it's a really good thing. Well, if you get the protocol working the way it was envisaged, that it deals with products moving into the single market, then it gives Northern Ireland an opportunity because it means Northern Ireland is an integral part of the UK internal market and has full access as part of the UK as well as access to the EU market. That gives it a competitive advantage. But at the moment, that's not working. And actually, one of the things I would say, I'll just slightly challenge what you said. When I talk to the business community, uh, the entire business community, pretty much, not, not all, but pretty much all, the vast majority, over 90%, say to us, the protocol at the moment isn't working. The EU proposals don't go anywhere near far enough to resolve the issues they are having with products moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. We've got to rectify that. If we can get that done, then we've got a structure that can so, work. But the ultimate question is, what is the point of triggering Article 16? Because all it leads, first of all, is to more negotiations. They're already happening. And second of all, there's going to have to be a deal anyway. What, what does trigger Article 16 actually achieve? Well, I think this comes back to my opening comment. Is we haven't triggered Article 16 because we don't want to. We want to get a resolution but why by would it, agreement. why would it ever well, be because, on the table? Well, there is a point at which we will have to take a view. Are the negotiations moving forward in a positive way that means we are going to get a resolution that works, that's got some certainty, that's got sustainability, both for businesses and the communities here um, in Northern Ireland? If we can't do that, then we've got to look at what do we do. We can't leave things as they are. It's just not sustainable, whether it's from a constitutional point of view for Stormont sustainability, as we're all aware, the tensions that it creates at a political level, but actually for people on the ground and businesses on the ground in Northern Ireland. Well, how do, how and therefore, so triggering Article 16, if we need to, and for us it is an absolute last resort, as I say, certainty is much better by agreement, but if we have to trigger Article 16, what that does do is it starts a process, you're absolutely right, it's again the reason why it's not the solution in itself, it's the start of a process, but it does allow us to give some certainty to businesses and to people that we will ensure that products can move from Great Britain to Northern Ireland in a flexible and fluid way, in the way it was always intended to do. Yes, it does mean, though, it's part of another process to get to an ultimate conclusion. Because isn't that but, the we, but there is a point at which we have to make a decision around doing what's right for the people in all the line. Well, and we won't shy away but, from But that. I'm not entirely sure triggering Article 16 provides any form of stability. In fact, it, all, it raises even more questions. It creates even more instability. Well, it does allow us to actually disregard parts of the protocol that are causing problems in terms of the way the checks are being implemented between Great Britain and all the line, which means we can get that flow of product back through. We've got over 200 businesses in Great Britain we know who have stopped supply in Northern Ireland. That's not good for Northern Ireland, that's not good for Great Britain, it's not good for the UK, and we need to make sure we rectify that. If we need to trigger Article 16 to, to get that process working, we will do it, but we'd much rather come to an agreement with the EU. That's much more sustainable and gives certainty for business as well. No idea when it's going to happen? Well, look, how, long things, do, how long do you give the negotiations? Well, though? What, I think one like, of the things. You know, I'll, months, be, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll be. Yeah, no, I'll be very, very clear about it. So I think one of the things we've all learnt from the past, uh, if you look at what's happened over the last since 2016, is setting floors and ceilings in public doesn't help. These negotiations need to be done in private. Have the space to have proper detailed negotiations. Lord Frost, Prime Minister, and myself, the team will look at those discussions, see how they're going, and we will make a decision about at the right point around whether we are coming to a conclusion that's good for Northern Ireland or whether we as UK government need to trigger Article 16. As I say, we won't shy away from it. This can't go on for too much longer, but we've got to give space to those negotiations. Well, there you have it. That's the uh, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland speaking with Darren McCaffrey in an exclusive uh, GB News interview. I have to say, uh, any time I've been involved in negotiations, unless there's a deadline, they just drift on and on and on. And about a month ago, we thought that the UK government was at a point where we were going to trigger uh, Article 16. And now, of course, we're being told uh, it's a last resort. Meanwhile, the choice goes down, uh, the cost goes up uh, in terms of people living in Northern Ireland for the goods that they buy in their supermarkets, and the cost of living is also increasing. So I do hope that the UK government recognise that all of that is happening in the place where I live. You've watched The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster. Up next, it's Nana, but for now, I'll leave you with that all-important weather forecast. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello, Storm Arwen has arrived and it's prompted a rare Met Office red 
weather warning. The strongest winds likely across the eastern coastal strip of Scotland and northeast England. The storm itself is heading south through the North Sea, but it's as these isobars really pinch together through the late afternoon and into this evening that we're going to see those strong, damaging winds. But everywhere across the UK, we'll see those winds picking up and there are multiple warnings in place. That red warning, though, first of all, particularly severe across the eastern coastal strip of Scotland and northeast England. Gust of 90 miles an hour likely to cause damage, very dangerous waves. Two amber warnings in place as well, a widespread yellow warning, and there are also a few snow warnings down the spine of the country. That's an extra hazard. See the Met Office website for details of all those warnings. Let's run through the weather then, because uh, we will see wet weather across the northeast, as well as those potentially damaging gusts of wind sinking southwards and this mixture of rain, sleet and snow, snow mostly over the hills, but pushing south across England during the early hours, turning a bit drier across the west and it's going to be a cold night, particularly if you're out in that wind, which will strengthen further. Uh, the warnings remain in place into tomorrow and there's the likelihood of further wintry showers coming in across eastern parts of England, turning more to rain as the day goes on, but still bitterly cold. Old. The winds only slowly easing, still the potential for some disruption during Saturday. And uh, look at the temperatures, three to five degrees, add on that wind, well, it will feel sub-zero in places. It's going to get sub-zero pretty quickly on Saturday evening under largely clear skies as the winds continue to ease. Still some wintry showers uh, across parts of eastern England. Could be a covering of snow in places. They steadily fade during Sunday, but it will be a very cold start. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge. And also, they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Hello, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Nana Aquir. And for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics 